questions. So now it's time to move on to our keynote. Our keynote speaker today is a Cullen Trust for Higher Education endowed professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Texas at Austin and a member of the Wireless Networking and Communications Group. He is also the president and CEO of MIMO Wireless Inc. He is the recipient of multiple Best Paper Awards in Signal Processing and Communications and has authored and co-authored three books on wireless communications. He is also a national, uh, excuse me, licensed amateur radio operator, a fellow of the National Academy of Inventors, and a fellow at IEEE. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Robert Heath to the DesignCon keynote stage. Appreciate it. All right, well, it's great to be here to address this uh, packed audience. It's a thrill. Uh, so I'm going to be telling you about a, a topic that's of a lot of interest for me. It's uh, 5G and its applications to vehicular systems. And so I'm going to go through uh, some things that I find interesting about the development of 5G, how it's connected to vehicles, and tell you about some things that we're working on that are going to make 5G work even better for um, this application. And so this is joint work with my colleague, Professor Nuria gonzalez Prelchik. So I'm going to summarize some of our ideas here. So to start off with a little bit of context on the who, what's, and why's about um, Vehicle Dex for 5G. So Vehicle Dex stands for vehicle to everything, and it could be cars talking to each other, cars talking to the infrastructure, cars talking to people, or other things. So to start off here, a little bit of background about 5G and some of the stakeholders that are playing a role in its development. So 5G right now, um, it's Depending on which uh, media you listen to, it's either already here, it's going to be here next year, or it's a few more years from now. Um, I won't comment on that, but uh, basically there is something that's, that there is a standard that has been finalized that has been branded 5G. And the main development behind the 5G that we're all going to be using is happening through the 3GPP, Third Generation Partnership Program. But there's other organizations around the world that are also developing uh, next generation cellular standards as well. Now, the, normally the people that are working on development of 5G, they're in um, you know, the, the chip industry, networking, so, or they're carriers. So these are people that want to get their intellectual property into the standard, and so they want, you know, they want to make the standard work well. And so we're talking chips, networks, handsets, devices, um, all sorts of different companies. Now, increasingly, though, what's really interesting about 5G is it's actually... Um, there's other folks as well that are playing a role now, getting involved. I mean, users, not necessarily us, but um, people that are developing apps which are running over 5G are starting to get in there. And then as well as application service providers, media entertainment, people that want to deliver video to everybody, want to make sure 5G works for them. And then increasingly, we're seeing even whole new verticals of industry that before were not part of the cellular dialogue are also um, getting in the conversation as well. And that's one of the things that I think is really interesting. So 5G is, um, you know, it's many things to many people. So what I have here um, on the left is our version of what's, what is generally called the 5G flower. It's this, um, you can see why it's called a flower, I hope. Uh, it's got a whole bunch of different um, features of objectives that 5G is trying to do. Now, this is multidimensional, so 5G is not maximizing every one of these simultaneously, but it's offering a whole bunch of new um, levers that can be tweaked so that you can get, for example, um, high data rates or low latency or maybe support many, many um, thousands more devices in a cell that were supportable before. And so I think that's the main defining feature. You know, it's this high level of flexibility, as well as pushing the limits on um, the, the highest data rates that you can get, making it higher than was available in 4G, and also pushing the latency down even lower. And you can see here the different industry verticals. And the one that we're going to talk about today is the automotive industry. And so 5G and the development of 5G, they tried to take into account the needs of these new applications. And you can look at this in different ways. As I'm a professor not working for one of these companies, maybe um, you know, I tend to be a bit pessimistic. But I feel like um, the way it works is that you know, so you're a carrier. Uh, everybody's already got a phone. Um, 
who else do you sell to? Well, you know, so there's probably a lot of scratching of heads and saying, hey, we got to convince people they need two phones, one for home, one for work. Okay, that was working for a while, and I see a lot of people carrying two phones, not me. Um, but it's like, what else? Man, how can we sell more devices? Well, okay, the kids have a phone. What do we do? Ah, what about the cars? Can we sell phones to the cars? Can we sell phones to the energy meter, et cetera, here? So uh, I think that's, it, to some degree, that's also what's driving this is just the need for you know, if we're going to spend a lot of money on this new infrastructure, there needs to be revenue sources to pay for that. And those revenue is not coming from us because we're just, if they give us 10 times the data rate, most people here probably won't pay more than $10 additional a month. So that's what's happening there. So a uh, little bit about here. So why, why vehicles? Why is this the time for 5G for vehicles? Well, so what we're seeing right now is that vehicles are becoming, um, they're becoming smarter. They're being equipped with more and more sensors, 20 to 100 sensors, depending on the car, um, that are being used to, to help control the vehicle as well as sense things in the environment. There's also uh, higher levels of, of computation. That computation is being used to um, take that sensor data and do things with it, and what it's being used for is increasing the levels of automation in the car. And so automation, is, um, is where the vehicle is, it's illustrated right here, progressively taking over um, the driving functions from the, um, the human driver. And so at the, at the lowest level of automation, which in all fairness, this is where I am. I have a very old Honda Civic that uh, has nothing automated at all, as far as I can tell, except for the doors, which don't even work anymore. Um, and there's the medium levels of driver assist where the, the car can take over a function, like maybe it can apply the brakes or maybe it gives you a warning. Um, at the higher levels of driver assist, it might actually take a couple functions. It might slow the car down and steer the wheel. And then to the highest levels where there's self-driving. And the different levels of self-driving, it could be that the vehicle is able to drive itself um, some of the time, but the human has to be able to jump in. It can drive at times where the human doesn't have to jump in, but other times the human has to be in control, and they're given a reasonable warning for that. And then in the level five is where there's not even a steering wheel because the human never has to drive. And that's the highest level, and that's the, the place where the industry is, is really going. But I think that it's going to take a number of years before um, all the vehicles on the road are in that level five. Um, in particular, you know, how do you kick off the people with classic cars like mine? It's almost a classic um, off the road. So, Communication can help in automation. It helps in all the different aspects of automation and more. So this is an, an example here of how communication can help for the advanced driver assistance, or ADAS. So this scenario here, this is, um, in, in Texas, it's very common. It's called rural road passing. And there's actually about 200 people a year that die just in Texas from uh, a fatality that occurs in this exact scenario where there's a car, um, there's another car in front that's going slower. We won't say maybe they're going below the speed limit, maybe not, anyways. And the car behind wants to pass, and so they creep over to start the pass, and then another car comes and, you know, they hit each other with high velocity, and you can imagine what happens. So um, you might think that, hey, I just told you there were tons of sensors on the car. But the problem is that the sensors, most of the sensors are also limited by, by sight, right? So the camera in the car, doesn't see any further than, than my eyes can see. So if we're behind a, a bus or a truck, you know, we, we can't see what's in front, you know, and LiDAR, radar, similarly limited. Yes, there may be some ways to kind of, you know, try to see under the truck, but it's not very reliable. So what you can do with communication is the truck in front could say, hey, um, don't pass. That doesn't require much data. Uh, it could, um, Th that information could come from the green car. The car could be saying, hey, I'm driving along, and then your car could figure out where it is and where you are and say, hey, don't pass. Or it could be something even more interesting where the truck just broadcasts a video of what it's seeing, you know, and you make your own decision. Now, may, that I find really intriguing, right? Because I think that a lot of um, the origin of things like road rage is that people just don't know what's going on. You know, you're sitting behind a truck and you're thinking, man, this stupid truck driver is going so slow and it's annoying me here. And maybe there's like, you know, someone in front of that truck that's causing it, you know? So you're misplacing your anger on the poor truck when it's the car in front of the truck. Um, I think there's a lot of societal good in that. Unfortunately, it could just be the truck and then, you know, what do you do there? Um, now, so here, 
uh, you need a reasonably low latency, but you don't need milliseconds of latency because it takes a bit of time for us to react. So, you know, hundreds of milliseconds is probably fine. And then the data rate, if you're sending a message which says don't pass, you need a few bits for that. If you're sending back a 4K video of what the truck sees, then you need higher, higher rates. So as you go to the higher levels of automation, I think there's even more value for, for connectivity and, and technologies like 5G. So for example, um, one, of, one of the challenges being faced in uh, automated cars is, you know, is getting the situational awareness and discovering the environment and figuring out where they are in the environment. And that's done right now using 3D maps combined with a whole lot of different sensing. Now, one of, the, one of the challenges here is that um, it's possible to, to spoof some of these sensing, or you, know, you could have like a cardboard cutout of a car or something. Um, so by being able to communicate, what you can do is you can, the cars can exchange information and cooperatively build a map of their environment and can figure out what each other's doing and, and where they're playing a role. The cars can broadcast what they see. And if you support higher data rates, the cars can broadcast lightly processed or even unprocessed data. So instead of a whole bunch of machine learning algorithms operating in each car exchanging their decisions, the cars exchange all of their data and then the algorithms process with even more information. And you can get more accuracy. It's also much more secure because it's really hard to um, spoof simultaneously a LiDAR, a radar, and a camera. I mean, imagine what kind of entity that would look like. So you get more security there, but this needs really much higher data rates than would be supportive of conventional uh, technologies here. And even at the extreme, what's really cool is that if you can get something with low enough latency, you could actually um, give control from the vehicle into the edge or the cloud. So the base station could be driving your car, maybe not from here to Washington DC, but maybe through an intersection. So the base station is well equipped to do that level of coordination. And then instead of cars talking to each other and trying to figure out who goes when, the base station becomes the orchestrator and says, okay, and schedules all the vehicles through the intersection, no traffic light needed. Um, and that, that's maybe, it's a bit far out, but if we have good wireless links and enough automation, there's no reason it can't be done. And so um, communication can help traffic efficiency in a lot of ways. At, at the lower levels of automation with basic sensor information, uh, you can just simply report what, what are the traffic loadings like? I mean, you get some of that information from applications like Google, but, but that is contained actually within you know, Google itself. So if you're the city of Austin, it's difficult to figure out what's going on from a traffic perspective. They have cameras around, but on the side streets, there's just there's no way they have without paying a lot of money to figure out what's going on. So as a result, they send out about um, maybe every year or two years, the, someone that either goes and counts cars as they drive by and records it on a clipboard, or they put this pneumatic strip, and you've probably seen it on the road. You do drive by, and you know it counts the cars. And it's, th this is not a lot of uh, information. And what they do is they retime things like the lights every two years. And if you've been to Austin, you realize that the traffic there is insane, and retiming the lights every two years to fix it is a horrible idea. Um, so if there was this kind of technology you could use, then the cities and textile, all of these folks there would uh, be able to benefit. And there's other things you can do too. The cars can platoon. The beauty of platooning is that you get more cars um, closer together, so they're making better use of the roadway. So, so if the cars could drive with a smaller gap, and I mean safely, not the way we might be doing it now, um, you could get away with, instead of building another lane, right, the cars just travel closer together. That's, that's a great idea. I mean, the road construction takes you know, forever wherever you are, so um, that's a good option there. And by the way, once we take the person out of the car, then um, what are they going to be doing? So they're not driving. What, what's going on? Are they looking out the window? Probably not. They're going to be on their phone. They're going to be on the iPad. They're on their computer. You know, if you're commuting to work, you probably want to start, um, you know, checking email, catching up on on the day's activities there. If your kids, you probably want to keep um, keep going at Fortnite. I mean, that seems to be crazy right now. So you want to keep it going in the car. You know, high high rate, low latency gaming. Um, and so that's also going to be really important for the vehicle. And that is a traditional application for, for cellular, but it's going to become more important because there's going to be more passengers in the vehicle and their demands are even higher. Now, the connectivity options. So I'm telling you about 5G, but there are um, you know, different ways that we can um, you know, 
get data to and from uh, vehicles there. So the de facto approach right now, the one that has been um, standardized for a long time and is now being deployed in, into a limited degree is called DSRC, Dedicated Short Range Communication. This is a standard that's built from a modification of, of the early Wi-Fi from the late 90s and it occupies a dedicated piece of spectrum in, in the upper five gigahertz band. And it's there for doing things like um, different applications, basic safety messaging, uh, there's like forward collision warning, avoidance, and then the vehicles also just broadcast their information 10 times a second to give the other cars knowledge of where those vehicles are and what they're planning to do. So it, it's an interesting standard. Um, the nice thing about it is it, it is actually standardized. It's been around for a while. Um, it does support very low latency emergency messages, but the data rates are very low. And the, the strange thing about DSRC right now is that it isn't widely deployed, though the technology has been there for a while. And we work with some, some auto companies and have had you know, some discussions with the companies about, you know, okay, so you guys, you're developing DSRC, you say it's great. However, uh, my car doesn't have it. Okay, we all know my car wasn't developed um, before the 90s anyway, mid-90s, so we don't expect it to have Wi-Fi, but you know, why is it now not every car equipped with this technology? Well, the answer I got was, well, we're waiting for everybody else to put it in, then we'll put it in too, because you know, the first person always loses. This is some, you business folks probably get this idea here, but I guess you don't want to be first to the market in this case, you want to be last. So um, as a result, it's not been widely deployed, and the, and the government and cellular companies are saying, hey, that's 30 megahertz of spectrum. Can we have that? They're not using it, why don't you give it to us? And so now I think they're regretting that. Anyways, that's DSRC. And then the um, LTE cellular folks got into the game and started adding uh, support for vehicle to vehicle and vehicle to infrastructure in the, the releases of 4G, LTE Advanced, and then LTE Advanced Pro. And as they have, the successive releases have come, they have increased the rates and reduced the latency. And so what I'm showing up here in the chart is not what can necessarily be achieved simultaneously, but I'm trying to give you a picture of both. So with LTE, maybe you can get, you know, Pro, Advanced Pro, maybe 70 megabits per second, but you don't necessarily get that with five milliseconds. But uh, it, it does have potential for higher data rates and some lower, lower latencies here. And then uh, 5G is really the only one that's gonna be suitable for the ultra high rates and the ultra low latency. And that ultra low latency is gonna allow this, um, this cloud control and then the high data rate's gonna allow the, the more of the raw sensor data sharing. And then you can see that the higher the rates, the less processing is needed and the more that you can share the um, unprocessed view of the, of the world. So, just some requirements here. So wh what's happening is that in 5G, the first version of 5G uh, is really focused on um, the, the wireless to the home. So it's not really been about mobility, so they've been, the, the parts of the early releases of 5G, it's actually enhancing what was part of 4G. Um, and so these are some of the use cases here that they've been identifying that they want to make 5G work for, but they're not addressed yet because 5G doesn't really support all of the V2X functionality at this point. I'm gonna comment on that on the next slide. So these are some of the things here, and these come from a standard document. This is from the most recent release uh, last month, so we tried to get really the most current material here for you. And I'm not entirely convinced that these numbers didn't come out of someone's backside. I mean, it's, they're not necessarily referenced, so maybe if you're in the standard, you, you know where the numbers came from. I'm not really sure. Uh, but you can see here, like, on the vehicle platooning, latency, 25 milliseconds, reliability, 90, 90%, data rate low. The data rate's low because in platooning, you're really just trying to keep the cars um, at a safe distance from crashing into each other. And uh, you, you, you want there to be, like, the first car is the leader and everyone else follows in a, in a coordinated way. Uh, and then some of the other use cases all involve different aspects of... Um, collective perception, situational awareness, information sharing. And the requirements there, I don't know why there are so many different use cases for what to me is, are similar things, but there, there's probably some reason for that. And depending on exactly what you're gonna do, they have different latencies, different reliabilities. The reason the information sharing, the latency is so high is that when you're sharing um, the process data, a lot, there's a, actually a lot of processing time. So radars, for example, um, even though they operate 
on you know, millisecond type time scale, they typically do all this filtering and processing so they spit out measurements maybe every 100 milliseconds. That's some of the automotive ones that we have in my lab, that's what they do. So, you know, you don't need to ship that information with a fraction of a millisecond delay if it's, you've already waited 100, probably can wait a, a few more. So, that's a little bit about the requirements here. Uh, but, but nonetheless, I mean, there are places where the latency low is good, where higher reliability is good, and where data rates need to be bigger. So here's a, a bit more about the status here. So essentially, um, the, the connectivity for vehicles and cellular is really part of 4G. So it's enhancements of the functionality that was in 4G. It supports vehicles talking directly to each other through device to device, and it also supports um, the vehicles talking to the infrastructure and talking to each other through the infrastructure. The, the first version of 5G, release 15, doesn't have explicit support for vehicles, and that's under investigation right now. So there's a lot of discussions about this here, and they're trying to figure out things like, um, you know, what needs to change for 5G to support vehicles? What needs to change at the physical layer, at the higher layers, resource allocation? And then the other thing they're trying to do is figure out how do they evaluate stuff? Now, if you haven't worked in a standard, you don't really realize the importance of this here, but the main thing that folks in the standard want to do is they want to agree about how they're going to evaluate stuff for the standard. And by the way, they, how, how they evaluate is not it works really well um, and it matches reality. All they want to do is agree on a way that they can compare the stuff that they propose so that they can argue about who gets what intellectual property in. Maybe I'm being cynical, but I'm pretty sure that's how it, how it works there. So, um, and that's really key. And so they're doing that right now. And so they haven't, um, develop the algorithms and parts of the standard that are going to support the applications yet, I've shown you. But that may happen in the next release, but it'll probably start in the next release and go further in the release after that. So now, uh, one of the areas of, of interest, particularly for me, is in millimeter wave communication. And that is one of the defining features of 5G, and I think it's really valuable for vehicles, too. And so I'm going to tell you about why that is. So we'll start off here with a bit of discussion about um, why millimeter wave for, for 5G? So up, up I have on the top here is an abstraction of a, an equation. Um, it's got a bunch of stuff multiplied together. It's just about as close as we come here. I have one more equation later. But, um, so the rate per user, that's the rate that we see from our device, is a function of these different quantities here. So the first one there on the, let's see, this is going to be on your... Um, right here, spectral efficiency. So the spectral efficiency depends on the signal power, noise power, interference power. This might be something, if you study information theory, something like 1 plus SINR, log of 1 plus SINR, or it might be something more complicated. Spectral efficiency, it requires, you know, having very good components and um, good signal strength, and, and in cellular in particular, low interference. But because the frequency reuse is so high, that isn't usually the case. So it's really hard to increase spectral efficiency. So spectral efficiency, not really something we can probably tweak much in 5G, a little bit. So MIMO, that's the use of multiple antennas at the transmitter and receiver. If we have a lot of antennas at both sides, we can get a factor of two or four on that rate. Um, the drawback is that you need the multiple antennas also on the handset, and the handset um, already has antennas for 20 other purposes, GPS, Bluetooth, not to mention the different bands. So you can't pack so many antennas on a handset. So that's maybe limited by a couple. And then there's bandwidth and the number of users. Basically, just increasing the bandwidth, you can increase the rate. The only penalty there is you, know, you need a little better um, wider bandwidth hardware and you need more processing. Um, but it's essentially linear increase. So if you can increase your bandwidth by a factor of 10, you can increase your rate by user by a factor of 10. And that's a much easier way to get a factor of 10 than MIMO, which you need a whole ton more antennas and spectral efficiency where you need um, to some, some miracle there to reduce interference. And by the way, there's one other trick here too. It's the number of users. So if you can um, find a way to reduce the number of users on a cell, then everyone, the, the few remaining users, share all the spectrum equally, and that's, that's good too. And that happens by um, frequency reuse deploying more uh, infrastructure, right? So if we had 100 base stations in here, presumably we'd have like three people per base station and everyone get a higher rate. Um, but basically bandwidth is just the easiest approach. It doesn't require any of these other things here. And so the bandwidths that are in 4G is in the order of 20 to 100 megahertz, as low as five. I mean, there's support for different increments there. And then this is from a study here that we did on 
network performance with millimeter wave for cellular systems in. So we compared like a baseline system with 50 megahertz of spectrum and a millimeter wave system that had either 500 or 2 gigahertz of, of spectrum. And what we saw is that under the right conditions, it was kind of weird, if you had enough infrastructure, you could actually get more than what I just showed you here in the bandwidth. So 10 times the bandwidth got me like a 50 times gain, which is pretty weird, you know. So this is going back and forth with the student, you know, did you do the calculation correctly? And there's a lot of soul searching about, you know, does this guy know what he's doing? Um, but it turns out there wasn't actually an explanation, which is that because of the way millimeter wave is used with lots of antennas, there's also a fair amount of interference suppression. So in fact, it was um, reducing the interference power quite a bit, which I said was really hard. It actually reduces it so much that, that um, and then the channel conditions makes it better. So, so that's the intriguing thing about millimeter wave. Now, by the way, if you don't have a lot of infrastructure, like say we had a bunch of millimeter wave infrastructure outside and the signals couldn't get in here, well, the gains would be very small. So you need infrastructure too. So some of the spectrum considerations, I mean, where is millimeter wave going to be? So 5G in the US, they have, they have allocated um, 28 and 39. Those, that spectrum was already there for similar um, services before LMDS, you might remember, from about 20 years ago. There's a big chunk of unlicensed spectrum. Cellular has started to embrace unlicensed and, and um, what they call, let's see, licensed assisted access or unlicensed assisted, I forget the term now. Uh, so cellular could be in that unlicensed band, and then they're looking at higher bands right now, 70 and above. And by the way, automotive companies are already used to using millimeter wave because radar is sitting there um, right at the upper end of that band there in 76 and 79. So um, there's already spectrum here for millimeter wave, and 5G is supporting it. Now the challenges in going to millimeter wave um, from, you know, from a, a scientific perspective, so one is that, I mean, you... You, the antennas get very small, efficient antennas. And so you typically need lots of antennas put together in an array to make up for that aperture. So you end up with lots of antennas. That, now, they don't take up a lot of space, but um, they all have to be coordinated together. The conventional approaches we use for um, RF and mixed signal design, the power consumption is typically too high, even for the base station. And so there's now a push for putting some of that processing in analog and some of it in digital. And then the processing, the, the propagation environment, the, now Maxwell's equations, they don't change when you go to uh, millimeter wave, of course. But the significance of different objects does change. Because the wavelength is smaller, um, I would block um, a millimeter wave signal. I'd block like a lot higher wavelength too, unfortunately. Um, but at the low frequency, it just passes right through. And so part of that is because of the wavelength and part of it is our material properties. But the net of it is that millimeter wave tends to get blocked more and it also scatters more than it, it reflects. And so the propagation isn't as favorable at lower frequencies. And then also the bandwidth is high. That's the whole reason we're using millimeter wave. But remember, we can't transmit more power because FCC doesn't want us, um, you know, uh, baking people. So I'm um, not saying that, that don't, don't quote me on that, but uh, you know, they, they don't want us to radiate you know, more power. So we have the same amount of power, it has to be spread over a larger bandwidth, and so therefore the SNR is lower. Um, so those are some of the challenges, and that has implications in how the system is designed, and it's going to have implications on the implementation. And so the way that 5G has really attacked this um, combination of challenges and constraints is been introducing what is called a beam-based uh, design or a beam-based approach. So in, in conventional cellular systems, the pilots are broadcast throughout a cell. And so when your phone turns on, you listen to these broadcasted pilots. And then when you want to make a call or send some data or text, there's a negotiation that configures the antennas at the transmitter, maybe at the receiver. 5G is beam-based, where pilots are sent on different beams. And so when you want to first turn your phone on, your phone has to find one of the beams being broadcast to figure out where the base station is and what's going on. And then it has to figure out how to adjust its own beam so that it can hear it really well. And this process takes a bit of time. And as you can probably imagine here, that bit of time is a problem for when you want to go to higher levels of, of mobility. And I think it's one of the, the challenges in the design. And I know there were reasons that this, this was chosen. The beam-based approach is um, time-tested. It's been used for the last 10 years in consumer millimeter wave. Uh, but I think I, it could have been uh, better. So the millimeter wave that we're talking about in 5G is going to be for um, base station to vehicles, this vehicle to infrastructure, vehicles to vehicles themselves, and then potentially vehicle to other things too. Now I put a question mark on this. This is probably the most important one here. So many of you are in cities where you have scooters, yes? 
Anybody? So I, I love and hate them. When I'm on one, it's really awesome. I love riding the scooter. And when I'm driving, I cannot stand it. I mean, on the campus, these scooters come from every possible direction. I haven't seen one fall onto my car yet, but if they could, they would. So I think this is a huge opportunity here as vehicle to scooter where we can figure out where those guys are and avoid them if at all possible. Um, ideally, maybe even tell them to stop doing the crazy things they're doing. So the last few minutes I have here, I, I want to tell you a bit about, you know, so millimeter wave is promising. Um, for v to x but it's not yet supported um, for v to x And so as, as 5G in the next releases is going to have to work on changing a bit their design and figuring out how to make it uh, work for the low levels of latency and the high levels of mobility and the high data rates that are being required. So now I want to give you some highlights of things that I find interesting. Some of this we're working on in my group. And in particular, we've been focusing a lot on ways to reduce the number of beams that have to be tried. Because you know, we, we think that this beam-based architecture where you might have to search over 64 beams of the transmitter and 64 beams of the receiver, so 64 squared possible pairs, it's not very efficient. So some of the things that we've been looking at, one of them is called sub-6 gigahertz aided beam training. So the idea here is that the lower frequency conventional cellular signals, when they go through the propagation environment, um, they go through the same things that the millimeter wave does. Now, now, as I already argued, they don't behave exactly in the same way, but there is some congruence. I mean, these beams in this auditorium here are probably going to reflect at both higher and lower frequencies. So there's some congruence between the two. And so our thinking is we use the measurement from the lower frequency to help initialize that search at the higher frequency. And we developed a, a technique based on uh, compressed sensing. This is the only serious equation in the whole talk here, um, where you can exploit that there's not too many dominant propagation paths in the environment. And if you have site information about the places where the paths might be good, then you can develop an algorithm that makes measurements only in the subset of good directions and then further tries to refine only in those, those good directions. And so. That's an approach, and, the, and this kind of technique can give, depending on how you compare, you know, the two to 10 times reduction in, in training time. And it also it lends itself to more adaptive algorithms. There's a lot of interest in these kind of sparse signal processing approaches, um, and I think that's, that's promising. Now, another thing that we've been really excited about has been um, this idea of sensing at the infrastructure. So right now, when you talk to the companies developing automated vehicles, they're putting all the sensing on the vehicle, the radars on the vehicle, the lidars on the vehicle, the cameras on the vehicle. What's the problem? Well, as I argued before, those sensors are all obstructed when you're behind a big fat truck. So you can't really see what's going on. Now, we could use communication to talk to the other cars and see what they're seeing and fuse it together. That's one approach. I like that approach. But what if we just put some sensors on the base station? The base station is normally not on the ground. It's on a tower, it's on a building. It has a much better, um, much closer bird's eye view. This is exactly why in airports, the air traffic control tower is above the ground. You know, and, and as a pilot, you know, I, I finally realized this here. You know, before I thought, oh, it's, of course, it's obvious it's, in the, it's high above the ground because it's close to the planes, right? No, it's actually above the ground so we can see the planes on the ground and tell them where to go. Because when you're a plane, you can't see anything. You don't have a rear view window normally. You don't have mirrors. So you're just kind of driving along like, I hope the hell I don't hit anybody. Um, and so the base station can, can do the sensing. You know, it, it can do radar. It's not obstructed. It can see the environment. And so it can ping the cars and say, hey, what do you see? What do you see? And it can also tell everybody, hey, here's what I see. And so we're really interested in putting sensing on the infrastructure. We've got a little tower that we put on a, a Ford truck, and we've done some measurements with this, and it seems to work uh, really well. Now, it does require redesigning some of the sensors, like we use an automotive radar, but that radar isn't meant to be a foot off the ground, and when you have it 15 feet up on a sensor it doesn't, on the tower, it doesn't quite behave the right way. Um, now, this gives the opportunity for providing data to the city. You know, so the city loves this idea because they'll be able to have a good sense of where the vehicles are going. They'll be able to track maybe these crazy scooters, the pedestrians. It gives a lot of data that can be used for making the city safer. And then also, we think that this information can be used as well for millimeter wave communication too. So not only are we going to send the data over millimeter wave, but we're going to use the sensing data to help millimeter wave. 
So here's an idea. We have a project on this right now with, with Nokia. This is on radar-aided millimeter wave communication. And so here, the idea is the radar is used to track vehicles and perhaps other stuff in the environment. And then we are trying to uncover how the communication channel, say that from the base station to the car, is related to the radar channel, which is the channel that the base station sees from the signal it sends to the car. So there's a forward channel and a backward channel. And we know, of course, if we know where the car is, we can use that for the, to help the beam forming, but we're trying to look at something that's a bit more scientific and look at the actual raw measurements and correlate them together. So we're doing measurements with communication channels, measurements with radar simultaneously, and trying to put this data together. And the initial results are, are promising. This is from a paper a couple years ago, and we've been extending this now. Another thing, I'm gonna say about LIDAR. Well, you know, we're thinking, gee, we did this for radar, what else can we do, right? Well, so LIDAR. We have some LIDARs in the lab, and we thought this would be cool. So we were thinking, though, okay, let's put the LIDAR on the car, and can the LIDAR on the car, does that help? And this is, um, so we found the answer is yes, but we have to use a little bit of a different approach here. In particular, we were focusing on a machine learning based framework that would help us figure out from, this is the simulation environment, this is like the LIDAR point cloud for what a car is seeing, to help figure out the correlations between the LiDAR point cloud and the communication channel. And we found things like that you could use the LiDAR data to see if you're line of sight with the base station. That um, is not guaranteed because the base station may not be high enough and it might be obstructed by a uh, truck or something. And so the, um, the LiDAR can be used to help sense the environment and can help uh, prioritize beams that you might want to try. And so we developed a framework for this and and use um, the, you know, the sexy tool that everyone loves now, deep learning, um, to solve the problem. And that's been really fun. We've been also looking at ways to, um, to do the sensing and communication simultaneously. I mean, it's very strange to me that, you know, they're talking about 5G being um, there in the E-band. It's not there yet, but that's one of the bands, like 70 to 75 gig. And we have radar sitting there at 77. So why can't we use the comm signal for radar too? So this was a study that we did where we looked at 11 AD and figured out that, so the blue car can talk to the green car and listen to the reflections of the echoes and can use that information to figure out where the car is. Now, of course, the, car can just, the green car can say, hey, blue car, here's where I am. But maybe it's wrong. Maybe its GPS is obscured. Maybe it's um, not playing nicely. So it gives you sort of an, ad an additional security. And you use the same spectrum, the same hardware for both. And that's something that seems um, you know, very attractive. We've also been looking at um, the applications, other applications of machine learning. So if you have location information, then you can use this to build up a database that helps to recommend beams to try. So some of the time in this green car here, I can just shoot my beam over to the base station, but occasionally it's blocked. So if I had two beams to try, I'd probably try that direct one and one that works when that direct one is blocked. But it's hard to figure that out analytically. And so the machine learning builds a recommendation engine, kind of like the same engine that Netflix uses to recommend movies, but it recommends beam pairs to try. And we can reduce by about a factor of 100 the number of pairs that have to be tried. And we extended this to look at an even more sophisticated setting where the base station, because it has all the sensors, now has the situational awareness of the environment. And so it builds a, a correlation between the communication performance and what's going on in the environment. So for example, if you can measure that there's a truck between you and the car you're trying to talk to, you know that link doesn't work. And in the former case, we didn't know that, that the link was blocked. We just wanted to try different options such that one was good. And here we know it's blocked, and so you can improve the reliability of predicting a good pair quite a bit. Now the challenge is figuring out how to process all this data. And, and here we tried our, our good friend Deep Learning, and we are actually able to beat it. Um, because we're pretty good engineers and we could figure out how to engineer the system with a pretty good shallow learning technique. Not saying that deep learning can't outperform under some situation, but you know, my experience so far has been that um, it's hard to beat good engineering when, when you have good ideas of, of what to do. So that's some of, the, some of the places I think are going. Now for 5G to support many of the ideas I've talked about, it's maybe not really 16 or 17. It's a little bit further in the future because imagine you have to start defining interfaces to all the different sensing technologies and you have to start defining this machine learning compute capa capability. So there's a lot that has to happen in the standard and in the system. But I'm optimistic that this is going to happen because I, I see that this is the, the way of the future here. 
So I am uh, out of time, so I just want to say a couple more things here on the conclusion side. So as at UT, so I lead a, a group there that is developing wireless you know, technologies um, for 5G and other applications. We have a center called SAVE, Situation Aware of Vehicular Eng Engineering Systems, where we're focused on communication, sensing, and data. And then we're also working with a number of different companies, including some auto OEMs, as well as traditional cellular companies, and we're doing some, some prototyping. Now, much of the work in my group has been probably more on the theoretical side, but as the interest in doing more things with data is growing, yeah, I'm pushing the students to you know, at least dip their foot into the, uh, the world of uh, practical engineering and, and try to make things that, that really work. Um, and so with that, I'd like to conclude, I mean, basically 5G is coming, it's going to be in vehicles in a few years, and I think that it's going to change really how vehicles are, are working together, and as a result, it's going to change mobility and, and how we move in the environment. So, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Heath. All right. Thank that you. That was terrific. Appreciate it. If 5G can improve traffic in Boston, I am all for it. Yes, <laughs> absolutely.